Hey everybody, my name's Sam and I serve as one of the leaders here at Coquitlam Alliance Church. And thanks for joining us for our online service today. This service is gonna look a little bit different than a typical service. So if this is your first time joining us for an online service, um, come back in future weeks and you're gonna hear more specific Bible teaching and those sorts of things. You will hear that today. But as well, a big portion of our online service is gonna be kind of celebrating what God has done in and through this building campaign, this new space. Actually, I'm sitting in the new space right now. So we're gonna celebrate that and we're gonna look back at God's faithfulness. We're also gonna take some time today to look ahead and to talk about what we're really believing God for when it comes to paying off the remaining mortgage of this space. And we're gonna take some time to invite you into being part of what God is doing in and through that. It's, it's called our For the City campaign. So we'll tell you more about that later in the service. But right now, my friend Andrew and the rest of the team are going to lead us in some worship. And so I want to encourage you, why don't you posture yourself to sing and to engage. Maybe you're sitting on the couch and that's fine, but, but posture yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a comfortable place so that you can engage in these songs and sing these gospel truths with us. So I'll pray to get our service started and then we'll do that together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we just welcome you into this place right now. And I don't know where my friends find themselves right now as they watch this service, um, but I pray that you would be very present with them as we sing these truths, later as we hear your word preached, as we respond. I pray that you would move and lead and guide this time. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Oh God, we look to you When doubt starts to invade It's all that we can do When the night leads us astray Would you fill us with hope again? Sing that again. Oh God, we look to you When doubt starts to invade It's all that we can do When the night leads us astray Would you fill us with hope again? We won't turn to the left or to the right We fix our eyes on the one who gives us life We will look straight ahead to the one who said Take heart, my friends, I am with you till the end I'm with you till the end Would you fill us with hope again? When we start trembling At the lies that we've been told And darkness closes in It's your promise that we hold That you'll fill us with hope again So we won't turn to the left or to the right our eyes on the one who gives us life We will look straight ahead to the one who said Take heart my friends I am with you till the end I'm with you till the end Would you fill us with hope again Oh fill us with hope again Fill us with your hope again We declare that you are worthy today, that you are holy, that you are wonderful, that you are marvelous, you're all powerful, you're gracious, you're compassionate, you're kind, you're faithful. And so we just fix our eyes on you today. Would you show us more of who you are? Mm. Let's sing worthy one more time. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. I just want to take a moment right now to talk about our giving and this is something we continue to do week after week as part of our worship to God and so many of you do that through online at cachurch.info uh, others drop it off throughout the week at the church office but this is something we do to further the mission of Jesus here locally in the Tri-Cities as well as around the world and so if you're a CA church family you can go ahead and do that if you're not yet part of this community if you're just exploring faith or a friend sent you this link uh, this is kind of family business that we're talking about and so no pressure at all to partake in this well, I want to take a moment right now and tell you about a few events that are coming up in the life of our church. And the first one is something that we've called Next Step. And it's, it's a course that we've developed that's happening on Sunday afternoons, actually starting this very weekend at our Mariner campus. It starts at 1 p.m. So if you're watching this on the weekend before 1 p.m., feel free to join us at our Mariner campus for this class. And it's really an opportunity for you to learn more about who we are as a church. Maybe you've joined our church through this pandemic. And, uh, and you haven't even met any of our pastors or leaders yet, this is a great opportunity for you to connect and to learn more about who we are, as well to explore more about yourself. I know I really love things like Enneagram and Strength Finders and Spiritual Gifts Test. You're gonna have an opportunity to learn more about yourself and then also how you fit based on who you are and who God's made you to be. How do you fit into the body of Christ, especially in this community, through serving and getting in community groups. It's gonna be an opportunity to get baptized if you're not yet baptized. And so if that describes an experience that you'd like to be part of and I want to encourage you to go to our website and sign up to join us for next step and maybe we'll even see you here this weekend. Second thing I want to let you know about is something we've called Light the Night and it's an event that's happening on Halloween on October 31st and it's not an event in our physical space in our church facility instead it's happening in your neighborhood wherever you find yourself and so we want to encourage you to engage with your neighbors as a church family we want to be the people who give out the large candy bars so if you can so if you can afford to I would encourage you buy the big candy bars give them out keep your porch lights on engage with the neighbors around you uh, and and then later in the evening at 9 p.m. we're going to gather together at Lafarge Lake and this is a great opportunity to invite friends and neighbors, family members who maybe aren't comfortable coming to a church service but they would be willing to come and, and experience fireworks on Halloween and just rub shoulders with other Christians and build relationships and friendships and so uh, we want to be actively involved in our community on Halloween, light the night, uh, let's be involved in this uh, evening together. And then on October 30th, the night before Halloween, we're also having something that's called The Gathering. That's a worship and prayer night where we come together as a church family from across the different campuses. We bring our petitions before the Lord in prayer and we also spend some time in worship together. So we'd love to have you join us for that at our Mariner campus. Uh, we're gonna be worshiping in our new multi-purpose space. And so you're invited, come on out and let's worship and pray together. You can find out more information online. Okay, right now we're gonna move into uh, watching a video, a really great great video that the team has made outlining what, what's happened over this last five plus years leading up to where we find ourselves right now in this beautiful new space, this new building, this new ministry center. And so we're going to share some of the story leading up to this moment. And so you'll hear from Pastor Mark and Pastor Diane, some people on the building committee and others in our church community about, about just sharing about God's faithfulness to us. So check it out. Since day one, our purpose has been to help people become fully devoted to Jesus, to help both seekers and believers dig into the character and love of Christ, to be deeply rooted in Him. That was our mission almost 50 years ago, and it's still our mission today. May this be a place where we are spirit-filled, word-saturated, sold-out, cross-bearing disciples who make impact on the kingdom of God here and around the world. So we're just getting all the food ready to prep for this weekend for Thanksgiving. It's going to be so much fun to serve everybody. It's been so long. It's awesome to be back doing that.
We're just prepping tech for this weekend. We're so pumped to commission our new building. Well, hey guys, we're just about to rehearse to get ready for our Thanksgiving service. I am so excited to celebrate what God is doing with our family. God bless. Happy Thanksgiving. It's amazing to see it all come together. We've been talking about this for so long and thinking about it and uh, to see it just materialize. It's, you know, see God's, uh, God's work come to fruition. It's, it's overwhelming. We've been talking about this for so long and to see it not be a construction site anymore, but actually be a beautiful building we can be in is really significant. This project's taken so long. We've been going for almost five years already. And so to see it done finally and be able to use the space for ministry, we're so excited to see what God's gonna do through it. It's been very clear from the beginning of this church that God had his hand on it. This was the biggest church built in Coquitlam at the end of the day. And uh, it was a big empty shell built by 100 people. And uh, it was an amazing accomplishment. The actual church services started on January 20th, 1975, down in Ranch Park School, just a few blocks away from here. Some of the people wondered why we were building such a large building. If we build smaller and we get the growth we hope to get, we'll have to build again in a few years. So we went for it. In terms of what first struck me when we came here was the huge potential of this building and what it could mean to our community in Coquitlam. It's a bedroom community at the time, lots of growth was happening. And to have a uh, church with the capacity and the potential and the leadership that was here, it was just an exciting place to be, and we wanted to be part of that. In, in the five years, a little more than five years that I was here, the church uh, uh, about doubled in attendance. We were just a small number in a large building, and we wondered whether we'd ever be able to fill it. But to God be the glory for what he has done, far above anything we could ever have imagined. The elders um, and Mark decided it was time to build. Where can we build? What can we do? So they looked at all different options. The decision after all of that work was that really our best option was to build on our site, close to our building. In January 2016, Greg Needham and Rob and I went to Florida to attend a conference that was put on by Enjoy Ministries. They got all the algorithms and all the rest of the stuff for their computers and they put all the stats in and across the United States and Canada, they were saying a church our size with everything we do, we're probably gonna only have a million and a half to uh, two million, that's it. We knew we would need more than that, but we also knew they didn't know our church like we did. Now, the first thing we did was went to our elders and our staff. Then we went to key leaders, key giving leaders in our church. We said, what do you think? We think we need to be doing this. What do you think? Most all of those folks said, good for you. We're gonna stand with you in this. After that, we presented to the congregation and uh, some of the things were a lot of fun. You may have remembered the dancing with the pastors and uh, we had a lot of town hall meetings and we did things, um, everything we could to answer the congregation's questions and put forward the vision. When people started pledging and it was over what we thought we were going to be getting, it was, it was really, really cool. We had the big reveal weekend, which I think most of you remember. We had the big balloon celebrating the, the number that we all raised. And as that number was revealed, uh, we were over $4.2 million. They may have the data, but I think we have the faith. I'm proud that God has called us to this, and we have said yes, and we're making it happen with His help. I'm real proud of that. I don't know whose idea it was, but they said, let's have these little flags and write some people's name, maybe one or two people that you need to pray for. 
And then we took all these flags, put them all together and put them right into the foundation of our church. That's what we're here for. We were able to put a name that we were praying for, that this ministry that came out of this project would come to the Lord or that God would meet them. The building committee has become friends. We pray for each other's families and issues that have come up. Rod had a son that went through some surgeries. That's been part of our prayer life together. It's become much more than just a building project. You said once, it's not about building a building, it's about building people. Yeah, I get a lot of people quoting that to me, even people who don't go to our church. If we raise X number of dollars and build a great church and everything else, but don't build the people's faith with it, we've failed. We've failed. The COVID thing, it sucked the wind right out of our sails. It was, it was tough. Not being able to be, would be with people he loved. Oh. When COVID started, we were dealing with the unknown and a lot of people were afraid. Things like uh, a worldwide shortage of uh, hot water heaters. We thought there'd be tons of kitchen equipment around, but the supply chain slowed down, it stopped, and then to get it became this huge issue. And it was a prayer factor that if we were gonna have kitchen equipment on site in time for our inspections. One of the uh, message series that I want to do right away is gonna be on fear. Fear not, because Jesus is with us. As leaders, you need to lead by example. So if we're asking everyone in the church to double their tithe, which is what we did, we must also sacrifice. Diane and I believe that God was asking us a question. The question was, you have a house, don't you? We said, yes, you could sell it. Now it's personal. I love that house. So we sold it. Then we said again, Lord, what do you want to do? How do you want to do this? You have a company, don't you? And I said, yes, we do. You can sell it. And I said, yes, sir. I don't think we realized when the building started what God's vision was for this. You know, we had something in our own mind and I feel like he slowly unveiled our eyes. Not only will lives be transformed of people in our community as they come to know Jesus, as they meet him, but transformation also happens as we serve. I think that as we open up this space, we're gonna see that our entire church will be transformed as we allow God to use us and to minister in us and through us. It will transform all of us. Father, we are so thankful to you today and we give you thanks with all of our heart. You have provided far beyond what we expected or what we even thought was possible. So now we come once more today with these requests that you, our God, will so fill this edifice with your Holy Spirit that every person coming through its doors will be aware of your holy presence. Amen. We give thanks today because of your generosity and we commit to being generous to our community and around the world through the ministry of this church. I've done six building programs in my life. This is the first one I've cut ribbons. I'm not sure what a ribbon is for, but we're gonna do it. Coming into the main foyer that we're always used to being in, and then just seeing those other doors leading into that space, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm still processing it. It's so fun, it's so fresh. I'm so excited for the new ministry center that we're gonna have, that we're able to provide food that's specific to people in our community and have the dignity for them to come and get it themselves. I'm excited to worship together for the first time in the new building. 
I'm excited for the large multi-purpose room that'll be used for classes and spiritual formation and alphas. I'm excited for our new food pantry, which is gonna allow us to meet the needs of people in our city and create a space of hospitality where people can encounter the love of Jesus. I'm really excited that the kids have an intentional space to learn about Jesus. There's so much about this space that I'm just so excited about. I think that our work hasn't even started yet. As we said from the beginning, we're not just building a building, we're building people. And so now the real work of building people and reaching our community is starting. I'm really excited to share with you today about the Ministry Care Center in our new building that's open and functioning. We have focused on food. Food insecurity is on the rise, and the need to make food accessible to vulnerable people continues to be the most pressing community need. During 2020, we saw a significant rise in food insecurity. One in seven Canadians live in a food insecure household, and that's 15% of our population. And for families with children, it's upwards to 19%. Many new immigrants coming to Canada, over one million refugees in the next three years, they say, will be coming to Canada. The number of people who do not have access to food continues to grow exponentially. We have unfortunately seen uh, more and more job loss, unemployment, and with CERB ending, an even greater number of individuals and families who are economically challenged and they're socially isolated and they need help. And so we see that people at work in the community um, are witnessing that children, single mothers, newcomers, indigenous communities, and black Canadians are particularly impacted by this issue. And so with emergency response funding coming to an end, we need to continue to invest and support this emerging need. Food insecurity has a tremendous impact on the physical, uh, health, mental health, personal relationships, social isolation, and even employment maintenance. Those who were already facing barriers prior to COVID-19, such as poverty, homelessness, and social isolation, need even more support now to access resources that are available to them. And so as of a week ago, we began servicing close to 200 families out of our food pantry. We are a cultural food bank hub in partnership with House of Omid. And we're so excited about this. Our mission is to share the hope and love of Jesus while meeting basic needs, offering long-term solutions, and empowering people towards a more stable future. So we want to also begin to offer budget and spending coaching one-on-one -on -one as needed. There will be referrals to community programs and government benefits uh, for those who need help. So lots that we can be doing. And I want to briefly explain to you the things that we value in our ministry center. The first is the gospel. Spiritual poverty is as important as physical poverty. We haven't had the space or opportunity previously to prioritize spiritual input, but now we have that opportunity to add these components. And we hope to use uh, the commercial kitchen and the multi-purpose room for a monthly luncheon, a clothing closet, and a place where we can have uh, worship and uh, meeting together with all of the families from our food pantry. The other thing that we value is dignity. We believe in creating an inclusive community where people are treated with dignity and respect regardless of their ethnic, economic, legal, or religious status. The third thing we value is hope. We believe true hope is found in a redemptive relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And then we value transformation. We believe that transformation occurs in the hearts of those serving as well as those being served, as God redeems hurting people and broken situations. And we've seen often as people come to serve in places like this, that they feel so much more blessed than the people who received what we had to give. And we all know and can acknowledge it is more blessed to give than to receive. I'd like to give you a quick tour of what our food pantry looks like right now. And so come with me and join me and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, come on in. Let's take a look around. And I would like to just show you firsthand what our food pantry looks like. So here we have our checkout counter. Welcome to the food pantry. And along this whole wall here is what we call our basic food needs. And uh, we hope that there's lots of good nutritional items and things that people will enjoy. So not so much craft dinner and things like that. We want to focus on healthy food items. Down across the back wall is our cultural hub. And so that is mostly Middle Eastern foods. And about two thirds of our families come from the Middle East. And so they are thrilled to come here and get familiar food products. Then we have a section that we call our bonus items. It's looking a little low right now, but there they can pick up free things that um, are bonus and above their regular um, gift card amount that they get each month. And then we got our new fridges, which we're super happy to have so that we can have dairy products and eggs and fresh produce, uh, fruit and vegetables. We have dates in here and um, these most of everything that you see right now on camera has been donated and we're thrilled that we can offer this to our families. And then if we take a, a, a turn around the corner here, the other things we're excited about is the shower. So uh, we can open this up to people who might be homeless and need to come and get cleaned up and have a shower. And so we will uh, register with Tri-City Homeless and people will be able to do that. And then in our storage room, we have a washer and dryer so they can actually do their laundry and come and get cleaned up at the same time. And then I think the feature in our room is our coffee table. And it goes right down the middle of the room. And so people can come and there's friendship, there's fellowship, there'll be coffee, tea, uh, snacks and goodies, and they can come and hang out. We can pray together. Uh, we can get to know them more and build that relationship that we, we want to have with them. And so we want this atmosphere to be to feel like you're walking into a thrifty store, not a thrift store. And there's a big difference. So thanks for partnering with us in the food pantry. Uh, if you ever want to come and serve with us, we would love to have you here. And we're just grateful that we're in this together, serving God and reaching our community. Well, Diane just shared some of the amazing ways that we're going to get to use this building. And, and really the heart of, of that, the heart of, of this whole campaign is wrapped up in the name that we've chosen for the campaign. We've called it For the City. And I feel like in those three words, it really sums up our commitment to be outward facing and missional as a family, as a church. We did not build this building so that Christians could just come and consume more religious goods and services within the four walls of this church. You know, we're, we're really excited that we get to use this space for great celebrations together and to worship together, to grow in our faith. But the dream, the biggest purpose for this new space, you know, our prayer is that God would use it as an outpost for the gospel, that it would aid in Jesus bringing renewal to Coquitlam and Port Moody to Port Coquitlam and, and to the rest of the world. And that's going to happen through our food pantry, as we saw just a moment ago, through Alpha, through other evangelistic initiatives. It's also going to happen as we disciple men and women and children in the way of Jesus and then send them out to be missionaries in their local communities and their neighborhoods, bringing hope, the hope of Jesus wherever they go. Okay, so a capital campaign. Maybe you're wondering, why do we need to raise more money? 
Can't we afford our mortgage payments? And the short answer to that question is yes, we can, or, or at least we believe we can as we've looked at the generous giving of our church family to this point and made projections for where we believe we're going to be with our finances over the next few years. Like Mark said earlier, as, as a church, we initially set out to raise $3 million back in 2015, and we were going to have to take on the rest of the cost as debt. Uh, we didn't know exactly what that was going to look like, but we knew that we needed to take a step of faith that God was asking us to build this building. And today we've, re re we've received just over $6.4 million in donations towards this building. And that is absolutely a testimony to God's faithfulness and to His grace. But it's also a testimony of, of the faithful, generous people who make up CA Church. In addition to the donations that have come in towards the campaign, our, our elders and our finance team have been wise stewards and have put aside a significant amount of money in a contingency fund to help with the first few years of, of mortgage payments as we get started. And so all of that being said, here's why we don't want to pay this off over 20 years and just set a, settle for the status quo. Here's why we want to pay this off as soon as possible. We believe that what we've seen God do in and through Coquitlam Alliance Church is just the beginning. It's just the tip of the iceberg. If you've been our, around our church over the past few weeks, you'll know we've been working through a vision series at CA Church, and we've been outlining what we believe it is that God's been calling us to do as a church. And that relates to, to mission and formation, to seeking the presence of God and generosity and multiplication, where he's leading us to place our time and our efforts and our resources. And some of the goals that we've set as a church are actually pretty scary big. But we're trusting God that, that if this is from Him, that He's going to provide everything we need to do everything He's called us to do. You can check out all the goals that we've set and kind of our vision stuff if you go to cachurch.ca slash vision. So anyways, while it's possible that we could afford our mortgage payments over the next 20 years, uh, we want to see that money go straight into ministry where we can engage in greater discipleship and evangelism, care for the poor, leadership development, and church planting. Here's some of the really practical numbers. With the amount we've raised so far, our mortgage is looking like it's going to be $2.5 million, which is much less than we initially thought it was going to be when we set out on this project, but it's still a lot of money. That works out to be just shy of $14,000 per month for 20 years. But here's the part that really gets me. One million dollars of those monthly payments goes straight to the bank in interest and doesn't help pay down our mortgage at all. One million dollars in interest. That means that a 2.5 million dollar mortgage actually becomes a 3.5 million dollar debt if we pay that over 20 years. And so our hope and our desire is to raise that money over the next three years so that we can pay as little interest as possible and use that 14,000 per month that would have had to go into mortgage payments towards more forcefully advancing the mission of Jesus. This is what we've been thinking about as pastors and leaders. What could we do by putting that million dollars into ministry, into Jesus' work, instead of mortgage payments. And so we would love to do that. Okay, so along with paying off our debt, many people have been asking us what's happening with the existing church building at our Mariner campus. And that's a great question that we've put a lot of thought and prayer and time into over this past year. The answer to that question is that we really wanna be good stewards of every square inch of this place. We don't want unused spaces to just turn into junk drawers or storage closets. So we want to renovate a number of spaces in our existing facility to make them as suitable as possible to meet our ministry needs as we move into the future of CA Church. So as part of this campaign, we're proposing a few strategic renovations uh, for this building, which is going to include uh, the development of a dedicated prayer room. You know, our prayer team has been praying in little closets wherever they can find space. And as we prioritize prayer in the presence of Jesus as a community, we want to have a dedicated space where, where people can come to pray throughout the week. And also where teams can pray for people during the service or during the service can be praying or after service. We also want to give our foyer space a bit of a facelift to make it a really warm and welcoming environment for seekers and those who are entering the doors of our church for the first time. Essentially, we want to match our, our old foyer with our new beautiful foyer space in the new building. We also want to upgrade all the bathrooms in the facility. And if you've been to our Mariner campus as of late in this last few years, you just know it's time to, to do the updates on the bathrooms. We're going to also renovate the basement, and we want to turn it into just a great lower auditorium space that will serve our middle school students and also just be a great spaces for classes and seminars and breakouts for conferences. We also want to update our sanctuary a little bit. 
We did a renovation back in 2008, and so a lot of that renovation still serves us so well. But we wanted to do some necessary updates as we move into this next season of ministry, just to keep things up to date and fresh. And so there's certain areas of flooring that need to be addressed. There's some fresh paint we want to put on the walls, and a number of the pews just need some TLC. Maybe you're, you sat in one of those pews at a weekend service, and so we'd like to fix some of that. Um, the majority of the funds for the campaign will go towards paying off our mortgage, as that's the most pressing need. But we also want to be good stewards of this existing facility, making it as usable as possible for things that God has called us to do. Okay, lastly, there were a few items that were initially in the plans for the new building that over time we cut out in order to stay on budget. And so the building committee went through those items that we cut out and they made a list of recommendations, things that they would suggest that we put back into the building as we're fiscally able. And so then we as a leadership team here at the church, alongside our elders and the steering committee for, for, the, for the building, uh, we, we discerned the things that from that list that we thought would make the biggest impact and were most critical for the ministry we believe God's calling us into. So there's three main things that we want to add back into the new building. The one thing is an outdoor kids playground. And that's going to be an amazing gift to families at CA Church. But maybe more importantly, it provides an opportunity for families in the surrounding neighborhoods to, to look at or, or to join us and to maybe they wouldn't feel comfortable coming into a church service or into the church facility, but they might be okay with letting their kids play with our kids, use our playground, sit around and build relationships. And so that's one of our hopes with the outdoor kids playground. Another, another thing we want to do is build a dividing wall in, in the large multi-purpose space. Uh, this is going to enable us to, to do multiple classes at the same time, multiple events happening, and just really utilize the space. And then the last thing we want to add back in is just some acoustic paneling around some high traffic areas to, to, so that conversations don't get really loud and, it's, and it can be really hard in an echoey space to facilitate community. And so we think that having some acoustic paneling is going to keep the volume down and enable people to have just great conversations and build community, which is such a core pillar of our church. At this point, we're looking at a mortgage of just under $2.5 million. The total cost of the renovations on the building is looking like it's going to be $500,000. And then the things we want to add back into the new building will cost us $250,000. So all in, we're looking that we need to receive $3.25 million. That being said, I mentioned earlier that our elders and our finance team have been putting aside money into a contingency fund every month over the past few years to help us with our mortgage so that we're able to, 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 to start off really, really strong. And so we're able to put $750,000 immediately from that contingency fund towards this goal. That means that our final fundraising goal is going to be $2.5 million, and we're praying that by God's grace we can raise that money over the next three years. Okay, that's it from me. We're going to take a moment right now and hear from Pastor Mark, a uh, sermon from the Bible. Check it out. Folks, let, let me give you, um, allow me to give you some spiritual life lessons that I believe Jesus wants to teach us as we start our campaign. If you want to turn to June, or, uh, Luke chapter 9, uh, there's a couple verses there that I want to pull out, but if you'd like to uh, get that your scripture in front of you, that'd be great. Think with me what it would have been like for the, to be one of the 12 disciples, watching right in the first front row on all that Jesus was doing. Well, it, it's a great idea until Jesus came and said, I didn't want you to watch. I've called you to go and do, not simply sit and see. J J Luke chapter 9, verses 1. When Jesus was called to 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons. And cure diseases. And he sent them out in the, pro, to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing on your journey, not a staff, no bag, or no, no uh, travel bag, no bread to eat, no money, no extra shirt. Jesus was calling his disciples to action. And there is no plan that Jesus ever made for us to simply watch him do all the work or watch others. God wants us to, and calls us to action. In the same way, I'm asking you as leaders to sacrifice yourself and influence others around you to be involved in the financial campaign that we'd like to start. So the first life lesson here is leaders, we get everything, we get everybody else in the game as well as ourselves. There's a place for everyone to humble themselves and do something and invite people to be involved. 
Second life lesson is, in, uh, is out of Luke 9, 3, where God basically asks that we should, uh, his people should rely on miracles. Now again, what Jesus is really saying is there is a miraculous that can happen. There is the supernatural that can happen. And God can bring these things. All that happened through the disciples was possible because they trusted the impossible God. And are we, um, when we rely on, our own, rely on our own giftedness and personalities, it's just not the same. We need to ask that God would do miraculous things for us. When Jesus asked the question of his 12 disciples, what should I take? Basically, nothing. Not a walking stick, no travel bag, no bread, no nothing. Have you noticed that when people have a lot of baggage with them, they rely on themselves and their own resources? It's time for us to rely on God and expect miracles to happen. Close to 19 years ago now, when the church was struggling financially, I said to the elders, all we need is a miracle. That's it. It's not that big a deal. We sim simply need a miracle. And the Bible says, give and it will be given unto you. So we started giving, even though we didn't have money, we started giving uh, to other agencies and people. And God turned that around and blessed us. That year, at Christmas Eve, when I came to the service, there was a $100,000 check under my, a floor, on, under my door from a, an accounting firm so that the person wanted to give this so we could never trace it back to who they were. God provided us miraculously and we learned the lesson as elders that God asks us to step out and trust Him. And since then, God has done that many, many times and, and has provided for us many faithful, sacrificial, giving people like yourselves. I've been asked by some people, where did you think the money was going to come from? Well, God, of course, and His people. That's the correct answer, by the way. God is getting creative at times and, and, uh, in, in how he's been giving us money. One story, a lady phones me and says, you know, the, Mer the Moneris machine uh, won't uh, work for me. And I said, what do you mean it won't work for me? She said, well, I'd like to give more than it allows. How can we figure this all out? I said, oh, I think we can do it. I got the, I got the money people involved and our accountant and everything else and worked the whole thing out. She phoned me the next day said, uh, the Moneris machine isn't fixed either. I can't do what I want to do. Said, what do you want to do? Well, I'll give you more money. Well, I got the people involved again. We did this for four days in a row. She gave almost $400,000. God is giving us money from places we haven't even asked. And he's getting creative about it. I think people need to follow, and people will follow our example as leaders, as we follow God's example. And I'm asking in this campaign that, uh, that as you give, make God part of the decision process about how much you should give, how much you need to step out in. The third lesson for God is the error that we need to uh, understand is that God always asks His people for a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is not for Him. It's, from, uh, it's for us. A sacrifice does two specific things. It tests our trust in Him to meet our needs and it reveals our commitment to prioritize God above anything, anyone else. The fourth life lesson is this. And it's found in Luke chapter 4. Jesus said to the group, as you step out in faith and reach lost people, do not greet, uh, greet anyone along the road. It sounds like such a goofy thing to say. Don't talk to people. What he's basically saying is there's urgency in our mission, in our mission here. Don't talk to people and lose your focus. Jesus is saying, nobody should be allowed to siphon off our best time or our best energy, our best resources from the mission that he gives us. So how do we expect to do this? I believe that in the Bible it says when in the direction of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, where King David prepared for the temple to be built, and he wanted to raise all the money needed so his son Solomon could actually build the temple. The whole process started with David because he's the leader. Likewise, the whole process starts with us as leaders. You'll find yourself uh, in the same situation as King David was. God asked him, and, and he asks us now to give sacrificially to pay for the temple to be finished in Jerusalem. This is our temple. David's attitude was, I will not sacrifice to the Lord a burnt offering that does not cost me nothing. He was the king. He could get money all in all kinds of ways. He said, it, cut, it needs to come out of my own pocket. And he personally gave, by the way, 100 tons of gold and 250 tons of silver. 
Amazing. The result of what happened when the people around saw what what King David did, they gave 185 tons of gold and 375 tons of silver. 1 Chronicles 29, 7. The truth is this. As we follow the example of God's leading us, we will be leaders and, and give tremendously to God's house to be finished and paid for. And in doing that, other people will follow your and my example. So first and foremost, we need to decide to give personally and sacrificially. David needed to give what he could, and he did. And the result of that was many people followed his example. Many. For example, and and many people follow our example. Let me give you a couple examples of of, uh, normal people in our church over the last couple of years in this uh, uh, campaign that we're in right now. The general fund of the church, let's say you give uh, 10000 in the general fund. What people were doing is simply putting 10000 in the general fund and 10000 in the building fund. Whatever they were giving to the general, they just doubled that and put it in. That was one of the ways that people did that. That may not be what your God, God calls you to do. I want to tell you a, a, a statement that I think is important. It's important to at least for me. I am asking you to do And I am not asking you to do anything that Diane and I will not do ourselves. I want to lead by example. And this is a quiet, is is a, it will require a faith step on our part and a personal sacrifice on our part. We separately agreed on the number that we believe we need to be giving this year. And then we asked God, how can we do this? Well, in our history, we went back to the Forward and Faith campaign where basically we were asking God the same question How are we going to get the money for this? Diane and I believe that God was asking us a question. The question was, you have a house, don't you? We said, yes. You could sell it. Now it's personal. I love that house. So we sold it. And downsized. And that gave us money, cash money, we could give the church. So Diane and I are praying now about being generous again. And we both prayed. We found out the amount that we believe God wants to, us to give. We agreed on that. And then we said again, Lord, what do you want to do? How do you want to do this? And he asked us another couple questions. You have a company, don't you? And I said, yes, we do. You can sell it. And I said, yes, sir. Now, that was our retirement plan. So we're going to be working here till I'm 70. No, I'm... No, no, no. There's going to be all kinds of creative ways that God gives through us. Some of you have sold cars and given the money. Some of you have laid, set aside a monthly fund just right, out, right off the top of your, of your usual giving to this. I remember the little boy selling his Hot Wheels. I will never forget that kid. Selling your Hot Wheels? Only the men can understand that. We stood right back by that door right over there when a widow was handing me the keys, or sorry, the rings of her now deceased husband. She said, I don't have any money, but I can give you his rings. I'll never forget that. Couple selling their vacation spot. They finally got exactly what they wanted. And then God asked them to give it away. A little later, uh, after Diane and I were talking about this and everything else, uh, I went to a cafe with a friend of mine, and he, um, I saw a table of RCMP officers on the other side. And I always go and say, if I can, thanks for doing what you do. I, I was, used to I volunteer with the RCMP when I was in Edmonton. And I like to say thanks to the guys. I did that. After I said thanks and with everything, one of the cops asked me, he said, you're the preacher that uh, is up the hill on Marin Way, right? I said, yes. He said, you're you're the guy that sold his house to pay for the church? I said, no, we sold our house. We're not the only ones that did it. And it's not like we were out in the cold. We bought another house. But we downsized and gave some cash to the church. He said, oh, amazing. He's shaking his head. He said, doesn't that seem a little crazy? I said, good crazy. And I said, there's about... I don't know how many people in my church, you should meet them, the the most generous people I've ever heard. And they sold houses. Why wouldn't I? They sold cars. I know one guy sold his boat. That's right up there with Hot Wheels. (laughs) 
when people drive by this place, they need to know that God provided this money through you and I. The officers shook their, head, their heads and called me crazy, and I said, well, crazy about Jesus? Yes. We give because God gave to us. He asks us to step out in faith and trust Him for the impossible. Secondly, to do, uh, uh, one second thing we need to do is ask that you pray for the success of the campaign itself and ask God what He's asking you to give. Ask God and ask Him that it would be revealed. Last year, our elders, sorry, last uh, time we went through a campaign, our elders alone pledged $579,000. Our staff pledged $316,560. And the leaders like you pledged, in the leadership pledge that we were asking from you, $2.2 million. And then God started building that. And instead of $3 million, we actually got $6.4 million. A couple things left, and then we'll go. Choose to ask and trust God for the faith step that you need. Grow in your faith. I love when the, the, the picture of the father bringing his son to Jesus saying, I, I, Lord, I believe you can do this, but help me in my unbelief. This is an opportunity for you and I to grow in our faith. It's an opportunity to be exa an example to our kids and our grandkids. So I ask you, will you pray about this? Will you consider what God wants you to be doing? and do whatever he is asking you to do. Amen? Lord, bless these folks. I pray that you would give them insight and all that they need to do exactly what you're asking them for your glory and the expansion of your kingdom, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us for our service online today. I know you probably kind of got a lot of information throughout the service today. It can be a bit overwhelming. If you have some questions or you want to kind of re-look at some of the things that were shared today, go to our website, go to cachurch.ca slash for the city, and hopefully you'll be able to kind of unpack some of the FAQs, the frequently asked questions, watch some of the videos again, and kind of get up to speed with exactly what it is that we're looking to do as we look forward over this next three years into what God has called us as a church to do. Well, I hope you have an amazing week. I look forward to hopefully seeing you very soon. God bless you, church. We love you.